Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for this next event in EV Sensi Week, the very first EV Sensi Week that we're doing. My name is Carla Walker, and I am the climate advisor for the city of Cincinnati. Uh, EV Cincy Week is a week-long celebration, actually, uh, and our nod towards National Drive Electric Week. EV Cincy um, started about a year ago, and it is the platform that was created by the City of Cincinnati Office of Environment and Sustainability to help drive EV adoption um, here in Cincinnati. We've been actively uh, participating in a number of events over the last year, of course, with COVID. Um, it has been quite challenging to bring people together and um, let them experience electric vehicles um, like we had done uh, last year when we got started. However, what we decided to do for EV Cincy Week was quite different. Since we are about one year old, we wanted to take this week um, and talk about where things are in the city of Cincinnati with all kinds of electric vehicles. And I'm excited about today's uh, event because e-bikes are EVs also. And Cincinnati has, for the last couple of years, um, been on a really amazing trajectory in terms of growing the e-mobility um, community and e-mobile community here in Cincinnati. I'm very excited to have um, with us Sean Jenkins, who's the owner and founder of the Garage OTR, who in our opinion is one of the um, one of the main leaders of the e-mobility and e-bike revolution here in Cincinnati. And we're also joined by Jason Barron, um, who is the executive director for um, Red Bike, uh, Cincinnati Red Bike, and who has, through the work of this bike share program for Cincinnati, has really begun to help build out um, the e-mobility uh, uh, community in Cincinnati as well. The way that our event is going to happen today is we're going to have um, a couple of video demonstrations. We'll have both uh, Jason and Sean talk a little bit about um, where things are in Cincinnati with e-bikes, um, how we got started, um, where we where does Cincinnati compare and how does Cincinnati compare with other cities. Um, and uh, talk more about how e-bikes are really uh, growing in terms of um, the number of folks here in Cincinnati that have them. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Sean to get us started. Please, by all means, drop your questions in the chat box. Um, <clears throat> once, we are once we are finished with the presentations, we'll do a Q&A with the audience. Thanks. Jennifer, if you could go ahead and switch out to Sean's video. OTR, home of Segway of Cincinnati. We're an electric transportation store and tour provider. We specialize in Segway sales and repair and rental for guided tours, as well as electric bike sales, service, and rental, and full service bike repair. So we uh, educate and entertain people coming back to cities. How is our environment changing? Suburbia is changing. The urban landscape is changing. Uh, the rural farmer landscape is changing. What are the effects of this? How can we combat it? I guess the segue mainly, and now there's different options for different people to get away, to get around, and to get to work or to play or to exercise. Streets, sidewalks, apartment living, condos, farm living, you know, you're, you're doing 30 miles between 
your rural environment, your urban environment. We have a product that fits all those different needs. So the idea is that if everyone can make a choice or a change on some of the trips we make, then you'll have more money, you'll have more time, you'll be happier, you'll be outside more, gas will cost less, air pollution will be less. Um, as Americans, 70% uh, of the trips we take are three miles or less, um, and that 70% of those trips are one mile or less. So if you walk, bike, jog, Segway, scooter, electric bike, pedal bike, any of these different ways that we can use to get around, even on top of commuting, which is a focus of a lot of our customers, um, all those variables get better. Be sure to check out all the different tours, accessories, services, and eco-friendly transport solutions. The Garage OTR, we're changing the way you move. For more information on the Garage OTR, go to thegarageotr.com. Located in downtown Cincinnati, in the heart of OTR, at the corner of Vine Street and Central Parkway. For more information, call the Garage OTR at 513-225-1583. Good morning, everybody. Excited to be here to talk about electric bikes. Thanks, Carla, for having Jason and I in uh, to discuss about the growth here locally in electric bike and bike share ridership. It's just a, it's a, it's just the tip of the iceberg. Things continue to grow. Um, wanted to talk first about some people may not know what an e-bike is. Um, an electric bike, um, it's heart and soul, still a bicycle. Um, it's just has some additional components, some motor to assist with pedal assist or throttle propulsion and an assist system um, that complements the rider's input. Um, that motor needs a battery to power it. So an e-bike also has battery and it has a computer that can keeps those the battery and, and motor and input from the rider propelling the rider forward, which really is a big help locally in the, the city of Seven Hills here. Um, they're considered bicycles by law, so you don't need a, a license. Um, you can ride them wherever a bicycle can. Next slide, please. I'll talk a little bit about uh, our start and um, starting the growth of e-bikes and, and uh, and ridership trying to, to propel the different services that we we offer at the garage OTR. We started in summer of 2008 as Segway of Cincinnati offering Segway tours and sales. Um, quickly grew offering scooter sales, electric bike rental by the hour as soon as 2011. Um, E-bike sales and service began just a year later, kind of dipped our toe in the market and, and understood that this was this was moving fast and it was time to, to get more involved. Um, we rebranded as the Garage OTR to try to communicate um, that we did offer different types of sales and service. Um, we continue to offer full bike repair. Um, another sign of a growing market, more dealerships. Pedigo Cincinnati opens in spring 2014 and Cincinnati is a, has numerous, numerous independent bike dealers that all carry major brands of bicycles and, and about this time is when we start to see those major brands bring more more models to market so most bike shops were carrying an e-bike of some sort by this time and then in the summer of 2014 cincinnati red bike started their bike sharing program next slide please We also added electric scooters and boards in the summer of 2014. And Cincinnati Police Department and Cincinnati Parks added three e-bikes and three Segway SC3s to their 
growing Segway fleet. Cincinnati does have the second largest Segway fleet in the country behind Chicago. Adding five more units in summer of 2015. In October of 2018, Cincinnati Red Bike began their pilot program along with B Cycles, testing 10 e bikes on the Cincinnati Red Bike fleet. Huge improvement in May of 2019, where they added 100 e bikes to the fleet. I believe they've added more recently. Um, and uh, here we are in September 2020, talking about how this revolution continues on EV Cincy Week. Next slide, please. At the Garage OTR, we've seen e-bike sales double year over year, with sales having tripled in 2020, really, been, really being pandemic driven. I've been joking that I'm a pandemic, pandemic pony dealer. I've uh, seen significant growth as people are choosing to be outside more often, uh, using it more for daily use rather than just leisure riding. Um, other trends are an increase in cargo bike and electric cargo bike sales. And we've probably sold more rear racks for bicycles this year than in our 10 year history prior. Um, riders are out there more often. They're using them for more things um, rather than just fun or exercise, increasing their radius and riding farther and more frequently than they ever have before. Next slide, please. Uh, globally, uh, numerous analysts are seeing the e-bike market growth rate anywhere from 10 to 10 to 24 percent from 2020 to 2025. That's just an explosion globally. In North America, we're set to see the largest growth, tripling or quadrupling our growth in that same period. Um, we did account for seven to eight percent of the global e-bike market and just 2018, but by 2025, it's gonna grow as much as 16, 18, or even 20%. Um, in Europe, which has seen high early adoption, um, they're set to double in that same period, 2020 to 2025. And in Germany, one out of three bikes sold are currently e-bikes. In the Netherlands, two out of five. And in Belgium, one out of two. Huge market adoption. The Asian Pacific market will see incremental growth in that period, but they are the largest market by volume and e-bikes have been uh, used domestically in the Asian Pacific market um, for decades. Uh, there'll be continued growth globally. Or there was continued growth globally from March through August, again, driven by a pandemic and people going outside. Um, brands like Brompton, Gazelle, Go Cycle, Van Move, seeing sales that are four or five times over the same period last year with 90, 120 uh, wait times for customers in some cases. Uh, City of Cincinnati is in good position to take care of this continued growth with the ever increasing size of Red Bikes e-bike fleet and the adoption of e-bikes by their user base, um, as well as independent bike dealers, e-bike retailers, like us, the Garage OTR, to help introduce and educate riders to the options and possibilities that e-bikes provide. Um, we say that we, we educate as much as we uh, sell and service because e-bikes are still somewhat a, a new thing. It's an opportunity for the, for the local market to, to understand why, why it's so fun to be out there on the trails more often than ever. We're here in downtown Cincinnati at the corner of Vine Street and Central Parkway in the heart of Over the Rhine at the location of the Garage OTR, your local electric bike specialist and the home of Segway of Cincinnati. We're here to take a look at a variety of electric bikes. Let's go inside and see what they have to offer.
You might be wondering what makes an electric bike different than a regular bike. Well, electric bikes have a motor, battery, and computer controller. Let's take a look at a couple different makes and models to see how they utilize these different components. This bike utilizes a Bosch mid-drive motor, an integrated frame battery, and user controls on the handlebar. Easy to use, press plus to toggle through the different levels of assist, turbo, sport, tour, and eco. The bike can also be pedaled off, displays your odometer, speedometer, range, etc., and current state of charge. This offering from Stromer is their flagship model, ST5. It features a rear hub motor, touchscreen controller, and full app control from your phone. It also features over-the-air firmware updates, GPS tracking, and theft deterrence. Let's take a closer look. These unique electric bikes from GoCycle are the Model S and Model GXI. They feature front hub motors, hidden integrated battery, three-speed rear hub shifting, lightweight magnesium frame, and the option of using your mobile device as your dashboard. Let's take a closer look. This Surly frame has been transformed into an electric bike. The Copenhagen wheel from Super Pedestrian allows you to take your favorite pedal bike and turn it into an e-bike. What's unique about this particular kit is the battery, controller, and motor are all three located in the rear hub. The Copenhagen wheel gives users the option of using their mobile device as a Bluetooth controller and dashboard. It also uses GPS and machine learning to learn your habits along your different favorite routes. 
automatically changing the pedal assist level based on your current location and behavior. As you can see, electric bikes come in all shapes and sizes. This is the Urban Aero family model. It features an electric mid-drive Bosch motor, cargo model with extra torque, the ability to run dual batteries, integrated hub shifting, and the ability to carry up to three children in its front cargo bay or up to 330 pounds. Thanks for joining us. To learn more, visit thegarageotr.com or stop by the showroom for your free test ride. Great, Sean, thank you so much. I learned so much in that um, session there um, that I could turn my favorite bike into an e-bike. I, I didn't know that we could do that. Um, and I learned that, you know, you can, you've got some pretty cool theme music there at the Garage OTR. I'm going to turn it over to Jason Barron to talk a little bit about uh, Cincy Red Bike. I think we're going to start with Vinny. Hi, this is Jason from Red Bike. I'm going to be talking to you live in a second. But let me tell you a little bit about the Red Bike e-bike. So this is the e-bike, as you can see. It's got a battery on the back, and it's got a motor down here. It's normally just an axle. This has a full motor. So what happens is as you pedal, it makes you feel like you're super strong. So you can go up hills, you can go faster, you can get started quicker. This is how it works. So as you come up to the Red Bike e-bike, you just turn on the power. You just turn on the power. There we go. And it'll tell you how fast you're going when you're pedaling. And it'll also tell you how many bars of power you have left, right? So if you have the four bars there, that's four out of five. That can take you pretty much all day. Five is the max. Even if you have one bar of power, you still got three, four, five miles on that before it's gonna die. Generally, the battery lasts about 30 miles, which is a lot of bike riding. A couple quick things about the bike. Uh, on this side, you've got the gear shifter. So you got one, two, and three. Three is for going fast on straightaways. One is for going uphill, um, and if you go down to one, the battery will do more work. So as you pedal, it'll go a little bit faster. Uh, the maximum speed on this is 17 miles an hour. Uh, and then also I want to show you real quick, we have the lock here. So if you get somewhere and there's no docking station, you wrap this lock around something like a post, and then you just push it into the little lock hole there and pull out the key. And you can run in and get a cup of coffee. You can meet up with a friend real quick, you can run in and do some shopping, come back out, Insert the key, and off you go. It also has this nice fancy phone holder here. You can put your phone in there and then lock it down. We do not warrant that it won't snap, but it is at least something you can use. Um, I can't put my phone in there right now because it's videotaped. Um, so that is the Red Bike e-bike, and I'll answer any of your questions on the Zoom. Thanks, guys. So great to be with everybody. Um, as you can see, the Garage OTR has much higher production value than we do at Red Bike, but hopefully that was uh, at least a little bit informative. Um, you also might have recognized the um, Bosch motor, battery system, and con computer controller, which was the exact same as the first one that Sean showed you in his video. I also apologize for the weird light on my face. Um, clearly, since my last Zoom meeting in my home office, the sun has changed position, and now I look like I'm in some art house movie um, with a really fancy director. So I, I guess it looks like I'm a de detective from the 30s or something like that. Um, anyway, so let me tell you a little bit about Red Bike. Um, 
So this is our network of stations. As you can see, we have 58 stations all throughout, um, kind of over the Rhine, downtown, Northern Kentucky and Covington, Bellevue and Newport. Um, we're in the West End, we're at Eden Park, and then we're up around campus all the way up to Northside. So we've got a really good balance of stations all over the place. Our fleet is about 600 bicycles now. Um, as you heard from Sean, uh, we added 100 additional bikes this year. So we're up to 200 e-bikes and then 400 pedal bikes. So at any one time, we have about 400 bikes on three to 400 bikes on the street, um, give, you know, bikes we have to fix or just rotating bikes in and out of the fleet um, for usage. So a cool, some cool stats about Red Bike. Since we launched in 2014, so we just celebrated our sixth birthday, we've had 570,000 bike rides taken just in those um, six years. Um, we've also had over nine, almost 90,000 unique users. So that's a ton of people riding bikes for the first time. Um, you know, Sean is in the business of selling bikes to folks that are like, I'm gonna ride a bike, I've decided to do this. I like to talk about, I'm, I'm in the demand, the, the demand side. I am getting people on bikes, getting people to try them out so that they have so much fun bike riding that they run into Sean's shop and buy their own bike. Um, and then just a quick thing, in 2019, we had 106,000 rides. It was our busiest year ever. We're down a little bit this year just in pure volume of rides because we're missing out on our commuters since no one's working downtown, we're all at home. You're probably all at home right now watching this Zoom on um, your home computer rather than in your office. Uh, but we also had, like I said, uh, 13,000 unique users last year. So next slide. So the red bike e-bike, um, as I showed you, you know, kind of what the e-bike looks like, we've got 200,000 or 200,000, we have 200 e-bikes in the fleet right now. Uh, we launched them in the spring of 2019 and we were the first um, bike share system, bicycle bike share system in the country to have e-bikes in their fleet. And we were the first bike share system to permanently have them in our fleet. There were a couple that had some early models um, that were out for a little bit, but they had to pull them off the streets for over a year to kind of retrofit how they were going to do it because the first um, bike share e-bikes didn't work out. Um, but, but we were really early adopters. Um, you know, if you ride an e-bike and Sean can confirm this, kind of the first time you take a pedal on it, you recognize what's different about it. You just really do feel super strong. Um, and, and you can really see how a bike can be part of the electric vehicle transportation mix or just the vehicle transportation mix, which is why it's so important that we're part of this conversation this week. You know, the ultimate goal is to, is to reduce the number of car trips that are taken or single occupancy vehicle trips. Um, and to, to have people using different kinds of vehicles in order to be better for our environment. But it also, when you're riding on a, on a red bike or on any e-bike or any regular bike, you're getting more exercise, you're out and about more, you really experience the city in a whole different way. Um, and you don't have to deal with parking. Who wants to deal with parking and have to walk an additional 10 minutes to where you're going? With a, with a red bike e-bike or with um, one of the great bikes Sean was showing you, you can bike right up to where you're going and lock the bike up and head in. So since we launched these e-bikes in, in 2019, we saw they saw five times the usage that our regular bikes did. And now if you think about that, we had about 100 bikes. So at any one time, we had about 80 or so, 70 to 80 of them on the street. And then we had about 400 on the street. So about 20% of our fleet were e-bikes, yet they saw five times the usage of regular bikes. So they were about 60% of all of our rides, despite being only 20% of the bikes that were on the street. And then overall, they helped lead to a 33% increase in rides from the moment we launched until the end of the year, which is what led to our busiest year ever. And then as I said in the video, you know, the e-bike's really great because it lets you go longer distances. So, you know, where normally a, a one mile bike ride might be enough for you, I'm done traveling today on a bike. With an e-bike, you can go that much further because you're doing a little bit less work. Um, you're also a little bit less sweaty. So if you want to use it during the day or to get to work, you don't have to expend quite, it's not, not, not quite as much exercise. They also let you go at faster speeds, which is safer. And if you think about it, um, you know, one of the biggest problems with safety on the road is the speed differential, right? So oftentimes when you're on the highway, it's not necessarily the car going a little bit over the speed limit, it's that car going way under the speed limit that's really slow and causing you to react to them as you come up on them, that's a problem. So the e-bike allows a, a bike to go just a little bit faster. Like I said, 17 miles an hour, but that lets you keep up with traffic. It also lets you get started from a stop sign or from a stoplight a little bit quicker to let you keep up with traffic. And then of course, the most important thing probably for Cincinnati, and one of the reasons why I wanted to be an early adopter, is it lets you go uphill. And as you know, Cincinnati has many, many hills. It's one of the things that's the trickiest part about really making bicycles part of our transportation um, network is just getting people to be able to bike that far over hills and making it convenient and safe. So next slide. So just a little bit more about Red Bike. Um, since we've been around um, in 20, September 2014, there have been over 2 million miles traveled on Red Bike, uh, which to put that in perspective, that's like pedaling to the moon and back 
four times, right? So we've gone to the moon and back on red bikes as a community four times. We've had 18 million minutes of riding. So just from time that we've had Cincinnati butts on bicycle seats, that's been 34 years of time on butts in the saddle. We've prevented over 1.9 million um, pounds of carbon from entering the atmosphere, uh, which is enough gas to drive ac across the country 900 times or around the world 100 times, right? So, um, you know, a pretty big impact on the amount of um, gas that would have been used. And then lastly, we as a community have, have burned 81 million calories, which is about 17 or 11.7 tons of weight loss. Um, and so that is almost six Ford Tauruses or Tori or Taurususes. I don't know the plural for that, but six Ford Taurus cars of weight loss is what Cincinnati's done, um, which is pretty impressive. And it, and it speaks to kind of the overall health effect and the positive effect that just a little bit more exercise have. I mean, a lot of us have these Fitbits and the, the threshold is pretty low. 10,000 steps you can hit with a pretty moderate walking around day. But the point of it is, is that getting even that moderate level of exercise every day or five days a week can have an unbelievable effect on your overall health and, um, and kind of just how your, your frame of mind is. Next slide. So I wanna talk about Red Bike Go too. This isn't necessarily about e-bikes, although this person is being incredibly dangerous on an e-bike and I do not recommend this riding style, although it is very impressive. Um, but we started Red Bike Go program in um, 2018. Um, so it's just turned two years old and it's been something that I'm really proud of. It took a long time to get it started up um, and we put a lot of thought into it, but it's been incredibly successful. Last year, over 28% of all red bike rides, of that 106,000 rides, were taken by members of our low income program. And that 26% of all members to red bike were members of our GO program. So I've gotten to a point now where I'm saying to people um, on Zoom calls, in person, back when that was a thing, over microphones around the country, I'm saying we have the best low-income bike share program in the country and on some level i'm challenging folks to call me a liar because what i want i want them to chase me and if they chase me and they beat me then i want to chase them again because i think it's incredibly important that we make sure that we have access for everybody in our community to ride bike share and especially the e-bikes next slide all right so e-bikes are hot right so we were shut down for two months at the beginning of the pandemic um you know when, when you get a call from the city that says, hey, we're trying to keep people alive, we need you to shut down, you're sad, but you say, how can we help? And so we were shut down for two months, unfortunately, which was a really weird time to be a bike share operator, but it's a weird year for everybody. Um, but since we reopened on May 28th, we have been incredibly busy. Um, first of all, we added 100 new e-bikes. So we had a federal grant that we processed and we built these bikes during our shutdown. So we were ready to relaunch them as soon as we were ready to launch. Um, and like I said, our, our Overall ridership numbers are down a little bit, but a lot of that's driven by the fact that nobody's working downtown. So we're losing a lot of those lunchtime pe commuters, people that are coming in and out and driving to work, even from over the Rhine to downtown, those rides have all evaporated as we work from home. But we've still been incredibly busy, right? So since we've reopened, casual rides, so these are by people that are just like one-off riders, not members, are up over 51% over 2019. You know, that's an incredible number. Unique users, right? So different individuals touching the bikes, and riding the bikes are up over 35%. And then my favorite stat, because it's ultimately the use of the bike is how much time is a butt on that bike. And that is a 31% increase over last year. So we're just seeing incredible ridership um, throughout the community as we continue to have um, red bike running around. And I think that's my last slide. Um, I was glad that, that Sean had all the stats about um, the increase of bike of e-bike purchases. I definitely thought I had more data on that, but every, every link I went to was just, uh, was all behind a paywall. So Sean apparently paid to get behind the paywall and it, and it makes sense. He's selling them. Um, I don't get to sell them. I just get to rent them out. So, but with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. Um, awesome. Thank you, Jason. Really appreciate um your presentation, the video was awesome. It's great to kind of see um, how Red Bike has evolved. And um, I loved everything, but um, I especially love being able to say that uh, Cincinnati was the first bike share um, program in the country to bring e-bikes into their fleet. Um, I think that's very impressive. Um, we've got a couple of questions that have come into the chat and I want to really just um, 
bring this up for a uh, conversation and discussion, uh, feel free to either one of you answer them. Um, and please also continue to add questions into the chat if some of what we're saying is um, prompts, prompts another question from, uh, from the audience. So you mentioned a little bit about this, talk a little bit about this, Jason. The first question that came in was around safety. And um, curious too, if you wanna add anything to that, um, Sean, there was a comment that there uh, was some concern about um, using an e-bike might uh, might be a little more, uh, that person might be a little more prone to having a serious accident. Um, and there's some chatter about this in the uh, chat box, but I wonder if you all could um, kind of uh, kind of talk a little bit about that. This person also asked, or I think there was also a related question about safety in terms of Jason, the shared bike program, how do you get people to wear helmets? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll, start, I'll, let, I'll let Sean jump in. Um, so it's never a good thing when a major um, media personality or celebrity injures themselves in using your, your kind of area of business, right? So um, Simon Crowell, um, Cowell, um, injured himself on an e-bike is rough. I don't know the specifics of it. I did see in the chat that somebody mentioned that it was a, a trail e-bike. Um, which are much more powerful. Sean mentioned that there are three levels of e-bike. And uh, on some level, on the two ends, one of them is an e-bike that has a throttle. And what a throttle means is that bike is, is also kind of like a motorcycle, and that you can ride on the e-bike even when you're not pedaling. So it has basically both functions. And then um, on the other end of the spectrum is the kind of e-bikes that Redbike has, which is if you don't pedal, then gravity takes effect, you slow down as you roll to a stop, and that's the end of your ride. But if you're pedaling, it gives you a little bit of boost. And so while there's a little bit of getting used to that first pedal, you're kind of like, oh, okay, this like has some movement to it, or, or sometimes it kind of gives you a little bit more takeoff than you're expecting. Um, they're incredibly safe, right? And it's, mo it's just like riding a bicycle, as the old saying goes. Um, the other thing is, is that bike share programs traditionally have been incredibly safe across the country. Um, you know, this is a knock on wood statement, but but we've never had any, any fatalities in Cincinnati. There have only been a, a handful of fatalities over the 10-year history of bike share in the country. And there have been several studies that have shown that bike share riding is much safer than regular bike riding. And there's a lot of guesses about what that accounts to. It might just be sheer luck. But what it likely accounts to is the fact that bike share riding is generally done in a denser urban environment from point A to point B. And so you're not on roads where cars are going up to super fast speeds, right? In downtown, you're generally going 25 miles an hour or less. And even on some of our areas like around campus or up in Northside, the max speed's like 35 miles an hour. So you're not out on some of the uh, more commuter routes that are going really high speeds. Um, and then also, bike share riders tend to be um, more novice bike riders, right? So everybody's seen that bike messenger movie where there's a guy cut in and out of traffic and he's in New York City and he's jumping over the curb and he's doing all kinds of crazy stuff. That, on some level, the more confident you are as a cyclist might lead you to be more aggressive in how fast you go and how fast you do other stuff. And when you're a bike share rider, you're typically more cautious. It's the first time you've used the bike. You typically are a much safer rider. Um, as to helmets, helmets are a tricky one. And uh, it's been a tricky spot for, for bike share systems around the country. Um, the safety numbers make us feel pretty good about it. Ultimately, we encourage everybody to wear a helmet every time you ride a bike. That is the safest way to go. But at the same time, we want to encourage people to ride bikes. And if people only ride bikes if they have a helmet with them or if they feel like they have to have a helmet to ride a bike, then what we've seen is, is cities that require helmet ride, helmets to ride have, have, are the only places where bike share has failed. Um, and so Seattle launched a bike share program. They had a mandatory helmet requirement and the program lasted about a year and a half. So you've got to find that right balance of encouragement but at the same time, not cutting off your nose despite your face. So we, we try our best to keep everybody safe in as many ways as we can. Um, and so far, again, knock on wood, I'm gonna reach out to this wooden picture frame. Um, we've been pretty lucky about that. So Sean, I'll let you jump in with any further um, safety stats. Sure, thanks, Jason. Um, you were correct about Mr. Cal's incident that was on a trail e-bikes so sometimes that gets lumped into the the pile um the bike he was on i think is capable up in that 45 mile per hour range um so when it comes to e-bikes um the different classes your top speed is going to be 28 miles per hour to still be considered that bike by law um, riding a bike you are sometimes coexisting with traffic um so anytime that 
you're out there coexisting. There, there is a, you know, a certain risk and reward involved there. Um, but what we've seen is that e-bikes make riders more confident and capable. Um, and although you are going a little faster, and if you had an incident, it, it might, you know, the, the increased rate of speed might be a variable involved. Um, what we've seen is the ability to go faster and with more confidence allows you to coexist easier. Um, and you are out there riding with traffic, part of the regular traffic flow. Um, and in a lot of cases, like Jason said, it's, it's a 25 mile an hour range or, or an area that you're riding in. So a lot of times you're, you're leading traffic um, and really running at the light of the, at the pace of the, the downtown lights better. Um, you have less downtime, you're pedaling more and getting where you need to go almost, getting where you need to go way more efficient than a car, about as efficiently as you can moving part of traffic. One of the next questions is, well, there are two questions that I had, and I'm glad to see that they popped in the chat. So one was about cost, like how much are we talking here, really? It, it, you know, I think somebody in the chat box said the last time they bought a uh, bike, it was about a decade ago, and they spent about $270. I'm kind of in that category, but it was more than a decade ago. Um, and then the other thing is, how are you, char how do you charge the bikes? Like, what does that even look like? I can buy some bikes in our shop. I'm sorry, Jason. Go no, ahead. It's more for you than me. Um, so bikes in our shop start at $1,400 and go on up. Um, I had bikes in the video that were as much as $10,000 to get that GPS tracking and theft deterrent and all the touchscreen, all the bells and whistles. I mean, the sky's really the limit right now um, in the e-bike market. Um, Is like there a, a name user? brand motor like a Bosch bike? I mean, you're spending, you used to have to spend $3,000. Now as adoption grows, it's, it's in that $2,000 uh, ballpark. Um, which allows the bike sharing programs to be able to use that mm. high quality, very dependable, sealed up for weather, uh, very efficient with its battery use, uh, Bosch Mid-Drive, which is um, a great company and a great product. Um, to charge it, you just plug it in the wall. Um, most bikes are going to charge in three to four hours. Uh, some bikes with larger batteries are four to five hours, um, depending on where you're getting that electricity from. Um, it's only, you know, 12 to 15 kilowatt hours. Um, here would be a coal-based electricity. Of course, if you're charging it with sunshine, then you're riding for free. <laughs> good point, very good point. Um, there was a question that came up. I think Denise, you had asked, and I'm, I'm gonna give Denise the floor if you can unmute yourself because she and I work a lot together with Evie Cincy. You had a question about, or you had a comment about um, Harley Davidson? Yeah, what's the difference between an e-scooter and e-bike? I know Harley-Davidson is supposed to come out with them next year, but they'll probably be very expensive. But what's the difference between a scooter and a bike? So a scooter is going to be more speed capable. It's going to be able to go faster than that 30, that 28. Um, so probably 45 miles per hour, whereas a motorcycle is able to go 95, 105. And both of those are going to require uh, driver's license as well as a uh, motorcycle's operator's license, uh, registration, and a title, um, whereas an, an e-bike doesn't require any of those things. Okay, that's a good. Um, they already have a motorcycle that's very fast, but so a scooter is just much smaller than a motorcycle. Typically around the 45 mile an hour. Okay, thank you. And no exercise. Yeah. <laughs> Um, there's a question in the chat and it's probably more like policy based questions, which I'd love to get to because I want to know how can we continue the revolution that we're having around e-bikes and e-mobility, but maybe accelerate it a bit. Um, there's a question around, um, you know, would it be possible to turn a um, standard bike uh, create a credit for a low income person to purchase their own bike, kind of like a pay it forward. Melissa, if you're on the call, uh, if you're still on the um, e event, I hope I'm, I'm characterizing that correctly. 
And I wonder if anyone, if, if Jason, if any of the shared programs that you know about in the country has anything similar to that, or is that something we can consider? Well, I will wait for Melissa to come in. I mean, you know, we own all our bikes, so we don't have any, uh, any opportunity to help others with, with their bikes. And, and like I said, we have a really strong low income program and we make sure that that's a big list for everyone. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm here. Excellent, there you go. Sorry. I, did, I, did I capture that correctly, Melissa? Yes, that was perfect, actually. Okay. Um, and so, Sean, I, maybe that's something for you too in terms of the commercial end of things. Are you familiar with any programs around the country where bikes that are turned in you know for folks who are going to purchase a new a new bike um where they turn them in or a conventional bike is turned in that can be create that can create a credit for someone who may want to purchase a, a, their own e-bike uh, one of our manufacturers that's uh, actually based in india and makes uh, scooters, motorcycles, bikes of all shapes and sizes um, was in the e-bike market with U.S. distribution. They no longer are. Um, one of the reasons they left is because of credit situations um, in other countries and continents where they were better poised to take advantage of consumer growth because EV legislation was allowing consumers to get a small credit towards the purchase of that smaller EV, um, I love the term PEV, personal electric vehicle, because then it kind of opens up that funnel to consider smaller types of vehicles, more personal size vehicles than just cars and buses and trucks and those kind of things. Um, I don't know of any North American legislation that has allowed um, credit on the individual level for the purchase of a personal electric vehicle. Everything's been based on overall weight of the vehicle and usually how many axles it has, that kind of thing. Um, nothing for uh, smaller personal vehicles that I know of. Oh, okay. Okay. Great. I get, I'm looking, I'm interested in purchasing an e-bike, but, um, and I'm looking to kind of let my standard bike um, go where standard bikes go. <laughs> Um, if that can help someone else. I, I was just wondering if that was a possibility. That's all. But thank you so much. Hey, there, are definitely, there are definitely places that'll take your old bike if you want to not throw it away. Um, Mobo in Northside, I think, is one that will take bikes in. They refurbish them and then they get them back out in the community. There are others, there's some other great programs. Um, it's definitely something I've always wanted to kind of think about with Red Bike. We just, it's a bandwidth issue, um, you know, to, to kind of turn ourselves away from just fixing our bikes, which can sometimes seem overwhelming, um, but I think there's a real opportunity there to, uh, to to put find a nice home for your bike. You said M O B O Mobo. Mobo. Oh. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much, Sean. You also mentioned that there's this conversion that you can purchase at uh, at uh, Garage OTR. What? How does that work? How much would that look like to convert uh, convert your conventional bike to an e bike? Uh, the example I showed in the video is a Copenhagen wheel uh, in, with installation that's about a $1,700 product um, that you can, comes in different size wheel bases depending on your bike. It's a great way to get a, an old favorite frame back out of the garage um, and turn it into a commuter, um, a grocery go-getter and start using it more often. Um, there's a wide variety of kits on the market. I love that one because it's so simple. Um, mm -hmm. everything's in one place. It's, it's just kind of plug and play. Um, mm -hmm. it's also very smart. Um, but you can get an, an e-bike kit for $800, $1,200. Um, they're easy to self-install, um, or we can assist with that at the Garage OTR too. Okay, great, great. Um, well, point out real quick, and, and you know, I don't want to, I don't want to, I, I just, you know, some people were asking about kind of how much can you get an e-bike for, and, uh, you know, I, I think that it's important to think about what you want to use it for um, when you think about how much you want to spend on it. You can definitely get a cheaper e-bike, right? And Sean said he has bikes starting, I think, as low as $1,400. i am sure you can find it even a little cheaper if you really hunt. But you're going to want to get something that's quality. 
One, you want a battery that's going to be safe. The Bosch batteries are incredibly safe. It's a company that spends a lot of time thinking about the engineering of them, the motor of them. You also want one that's going to be reliable, right? If you're going to, if you're, if you're going to get an e-bike to tool around the weekend on a trail, that's probably fine. If you're going to get one that's going to have you out on the road and have you going from point A to point B, you know, you don't necessarily have to get the $10,000 one, but I think you do want to think about whether you want to wait and get the right thing for you or whether you want to just get something quick because it really is important to have something that's safe and going to keep you safe out of the mm-hmm. No, that's a really good point. I actually was going to ask you guys, what are the, um, what, what kinds of characteristics for e-bikes or what issues and concerns should um, folks be thinking about if they want to purchase an e-bike? So I'm glad you answered that question. Um, we only have a couple of minutes left, and so I want to want to ask a, a, a question in general around um, electrification here and electrification of Cincinnati. So most of the folks on the call who have been on any of our EV Cincy Week um, pro, uh, events or have attended some of our EV room Zooms um, that we've had over the last couple of months know a little bit about that um, the work that Cincinnati is doing to transition its fleet to 100% electric um, and also try to build out the EV charging infrastructure. And I'd be curious to know from you all's perspective, like what are, what are some interesting examples of what might be happening in other cities that we can learn from to help accelerate um, EV bike, I'm sorry, e-bike adoption and really begin to increase that number of, uh, that Jason, you show, which is really impressive, impressive, the carbon reduction numbers that you guys have. Um, how, How can, what can be done? What other potential programs? Is it additional education? Is it promotion? I'd, I'd love to know your thoughts on what we can be doing here in the city to, to do more and do better. I think promotion definitely helps, right? I mean, at any time, like what I found, we bought just an off the shelf Trek e-bike. Um, Trek's the company that makes all of our bikes. Um, a year before the e-bikes that we have in the, in the fleet were even developed, they were still prototypes. We just bought one to ride around and let people try it out. And anytime anybody sits on an e-bike and rides it, there's a thing that clicks and they realize that this could be part of transportation. This could be how I get around in a way that a bicycle doesn't necessarily do. Now, we had lots of people that were converted by bicycles and started biking. We just introduced regular red bike, but the e-bikes were a game changer. So I think anything you can do to promote people getting on bikes, to have people take test rides, to have people sample them, is great for getting people to convert. Um, and then when you talk about kind of infrastructure, for personal, for people's personal e-bikes, you know, you, it's pretty easy to charge, right? It's just a simple key, you pull the battery out, you plug it into the wall, and you can charge it that way. I'm sure there are some where you have to actually charge, plug the bike into the wall, but I'm pretty sure that's less common. Sean can speak to that. We change out all our batteries for our bikes, for the red bike fleet. Um, there are some cities that are experimenting with their, with their, uh, local power company about putting in charging stations where you might be able to charge electric scooters, electric bikes, personal electric bikes, bike share electric bikes, all kinds of stuff in the public right away. And I I haven't seen any where it's fully kind of taken off. Anybody's fully figured it out, but I think it's really interesting. I know the company that makes our bikes and stations are looking at um, charging infrastructure at the stations. Now that's just like in charge installing anything. That's really expensive. So you got to find the money for that. But I think that would be a real game changer for us to not have to go around and charge the batteries and make sure they were kind of fully charged no matter where they were at all times. Um, so I think, I think that we could see some interesting stuff like that coming down the pike. And then in the future, I really liked kind of some of the stuff that I, I, somebody in the chat says that $100,000 or $1,000 e-bike, um, some sort of a grant program in New York City is being proposed. I think something like that can really help too to encourage people to adopt it. And then also just think about ways to encourage people to, um, to ride it more often, right? You don't want it to just get dust in your in your closet. Gotcha, Sean. Would you add anything? Uh, Jason's right. Um, we do these touch and feel events. That's what we've done in past uh, National Drive Electric Week years. Is uh, we get out there with the cars, and you get to see that light bulb go off and say, "This e bike is similar to this car, and it it can get me around in a day to day fashion." Um, that, that's an important step for people to see and understand. Um, some of the challenges that e-bikes have are the same as any bike has is you need to place more places to ride them safely, um, places to lock them. Um, and then additionally, like Jason talked a lot about, 
somewhere to charge them. Um, so Cincinnati's catching up regionally on charging stations. Um, mm -hmm. I know there's in Ohio, there's four or five cities that have the Shell partnered green lot. Um, Columbus has, I believe, up to 78 stations installed now. Um, so it, it takes that infrastructure of where to ride it, where to lock it, and where to charge it to take us to that next level. Great. Well, I really learned so much today. I learned a lot on all of these events, and I'm super excited about what you guys have been able to do to help Cincy become a little more EV, EV ready and EV friendly. Um, and we have a great story to tell. I mean, you know, just from hearing what you all are doing, and I know that there are a number of other um, bike shops who are um, kind of actively engaged in working and, and, and selling bikes and sharing the e-bike story, but it's really, really good to hear um, what we're doing, where we came from, um, what we might be able to do better. Um, and quite honestly, I'm super um, stoked that we finally got a chance to bring you guys into this conversation and to have this um, discussion. Um, I completely agree with both of you. Um, E-bikes are um, part of the transit and transportation solution in Cincinnati, especially in terms of the climate change work that we're doing. Um, and so as much as we can continue to promote what you all are doing and help out with that, we will definitely do that. So thanks everybody for attending. We really appreciate it. Thanks for being a part of the very first EV Cincy Week. Um, well, Carla, thanks for having us and thanks for all that you and Jennifer are doing to, uh, to make you EV Cincy Week happen and to make EV Cincy in general happen. And uh, thanks to everybody that tuned in. Um, this was uh, great to talk to all of you and spend a little bit of your Wednesday with us. And great. Hope See you on an e-bike soon. See you later. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Really enjoyed it. Sure thing. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Okay.